Welcome back to our grand tour of America's unwritten constitution, uh, a set of uh, tools and techniques of going beyond the written constitution, beneath it, behind it, beyond it, yet nevertheless remaining faithful to it. Uh, and we've talked about different ways of doing that. We've talked about how we need to read the Constitution as a whole. There's no clause that specifically directs us to do that. There's no clause that says we shouldn't. And the Constitution was, of course, ratified as a whole. And in one of the most famous cases ever decided, uh, the case of McCullough versus Maryland, John Marshall very famously reminds us, we must never forget, he said, that it is a constitution we are expounding. That is an entire document, not a clause, not, not a word, um, but a constitution, a system. And so we began this guided tour by talking about the need to, to read the constitution holistically, seeing larger principles, separation of powers, checks and balances, limited government, federalism, the rule of law, uh, the idea that no man should be a judge in his own case. Uh, we talked about another technique, about uh, looking at how the Constitution was in fact ordained, the process by which it was enacted, and seeing if there were deep and important principles in that process, as indeed there were principles of free speech and majority rule. And later, um, when we focused on how the Constitution was in fact amended, the particular processes by which it was amended, um, we see other principles very uh, I uh, significant in our system, like the, the principle of a robust Republican government, a principle at the heart of the 14th Amendment and the way it actually came about, the way it was enacted. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we talked about America's lived constitution, a set of, of um, principles of un unwritten constitutional rights that Americans have embodied just by living out their lives in ordinary ways, unselfconscious ways. But in, in the process of living out their lives, they've embodied certain basic rights w without even thinking about it very much. The right to have a dog, um, to play the fiddle, to wear a hat, um, to enjoy um, family life uh, um, with your loved ones and to, to raise your children. Uh, we talked about looking at the Constitution through the prism of case law, in particular uh, the case law of the Warren Court. The case law is not ex in itself a part of this written constitution, this, this terse text. I'm reaching here in my pocket to pull it out. I always got at least one copy. Okay, so, so this is the terse text. This is the written constitution. Case law, all the judicial decisions, they're not formally part of this. They're part of an, as it were, an unwritten constitution, but they offer a set of, of lenses, a, a prism, through which, of course, we read the terse text. And that's uh, what we talked about in our discussion of the Warren Court um, and the role of precedent more generally. We talked about uh, the role that certain special texts, constitutive texts, constitutional texts, if you will, outside the formal written constitution. We talked about the role that some of these special iconic texts play in our national constitutional culture. Texts like the Declaration of Independence and the I Have a Dream speech and the Brown versus Board of Education case and the Gettysburg Address. I ended the last chapter by reminding you that, uh, that Lincoln is, in, in my phrase, the man. Um, uh, we very much live in Lincoln's Constitution, not just the Founders, but Lincoln's Constitution. And we, in all sorts of ways, conscious and unconscious, read the Constitution um, from a Lincolnian perspective. And then I said, okay, if Lincoln is the man, what about women? What about the ladies? Um, and by the ladies, I want to remind you, actually, of a famous letter that, that Abigail Adams uh, wrote to John Adams, her husband, in 1776, in which she uh, very famously urged John Adams and his fellow revolutionaries to, quote, remember the ladies, unquote. I'm going to come back to that at the end of next lecture, tell you a little bit more about um, that um, letter that Abigail wrote to John. Uh, but let's take that admonition seriously. Let's remember the ladies and see how that um, admonition plays into uh, um, America's constitutional culture, um, written and unwritten. So here's uh, a key fact about the written constitution. It describes itself as 
uh, in the preamble as having been ordained and established by the people. And later on in Article 6, it again refers to itself, this constitution, just as it does in the preamble, and it says, this constitution is the supreme law. So the preamble says, this constitution is ordained, you know, this, this written text, is ordained and established by the people, and then later on in Article 6, it says, this constitution, again, this text, is the supreme law of the land. And these two patches of text where the document refers to itself. They're not the only two patches, but these two in particular are linked, it seems to me, by uh, a theory of legitimacy, uh, a theory of popular sovereignty. The consti this constitution is the supreme law of the land because it was ordained and established by the people in a process that was particularly inclusive, that involved more people than anything ever before in the history of planet Earth. Um, uh, um, that, that and, uh, a very wide swath of ordinary Americans in 1788, um, 1787-88, were allowed to participate in the ordainment process. And that's why this Constitution should trump an ordinary statute passed perhaps more recently, uh, enacted in the ordinary ways by ordinary legislatures because there isn't that, um, uh, the ordinary statute can't claim that kind of popular sovereignty mandate that this Constitution um, itself can claim by the fact of its special ordainment and establishment. Similarly, amendments to the Constitution, precisely because they have to go through a very special process, they have to win the uh, support of two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the states. Um, they've, uh, these amendments, precisely because they reflect a particularly broad and deep democratic consensus are entitled to trump a statute, even a more recent statute, just passed by ordinary legislatures um, in the ordinary way, um, without n necessarily um, having um, achieved the special supermajorities of two-thirds House, two-thirds Senate, three-quarters of the states. So that's a theory of popular sovereignty that I think legitimates the idea that the Constitution is supreme law because it's in some sense more deeply democratic. Okay, so that's the theory. And then along comes the 19th Amendment. That's the woman's suffrage amendment. And I think this complicates the story because once woman's suffrage is actually embraced as the constitutional principle, it, it's, it's, this amendment is unintentionally, uh, perhaps, but, but deeply unsettling because I think the deep logic of the 19th Amendment is that women are equal political participants, but of course they weren't um, at the founding or during the Reconstruction. In fact, they weren't even equal political participants in the very process by which the 19th Amendment became law. And so the, the nanosecond that the 19th Amendment becomes part of the supreme law of the land, I think it, it complicates and unsettles to some extent um, this popular sovereignty story we've been telling. Um, and the precise extent to which it unsettles isn't explicitly um, uh, specified in the 19th Amendment. To some extent, it's unwritten. And what I'd like to do in today's lecture and uh, the companion one is to explore the, the profound implications of the 19th Amendment, of um, uh, the, the suffrage revolution uh, and um, what it might mean for American constitutionalism. Uh, so let's begin um, with a hypothetical. Let's imagine that Congress tomorrow were to pass a sweeping law of uh, aiming to vindicate women's rights, a law kind of along the lines of a statute called the Violence Against Women's Act um, that Congress actually um, did pass a, a, a while back and, and part of which the Supreme Court, in fact, invalidated. Uh, as going beyond Congress's power. Let's imagine that this law says that um, private violence against um, women, uh, when a man attacks a, a woman because she's a woman, uh, targets her um, uh, because of uh, her, her, her gender, um, is now um, a, a federal um, offense of some sort. And let's imagine that the law provides for special civil remedies for women who have been targeted um, uh, for, uh, uh, by violent men because they are women. Let's imagine this law further provides all sorts of, of uh, protections of, of women against governmental discrimination and private employer discrimination. Um, 
And now let's imagine that some people raise questions about whether Congress legitimately has the power to pass a law like that. Now, I think if you just read the text of the Constitution, you can see that it's fairly capable of being read to support this congressional law. Remember, the 14th Amendment begins by saying everyone born in America is born a citizen. That is, where everyone is born equal, an equal citizen. And um, women are born equally with men. And the last sentence of that amendment says Congress shall have power to enforce this. And the 19th Amendment is all about sex discrimination. Um, and there's another clause that says Congress shall have power to enforce this by appropriate legislation. So you might think that Congress has very sweeping power to protect women's rights against all sorts of threats to them, um, uh, uh, threats against women as women. Uh, but, but here's the counter argument. Well, maybe the text is broad enough, but... Actually, we think the legislative history, a, a critic might say, of the 14th Amendment shows that it's all about race. It doesn't say race, but really we think that when you look at the legislative history, it's about race and not sex. Um, and the 19th Amendment, yes, it's about sex discrimination, but sex discrimination in voting. And what does private violence against women have to do with voting? What does um, uh, employment discrimination have to do with voting? Um, and so, so, so we don't think, based on the legislative history, that the Congress has the sweeping power. Now, I myself think that they've got the history to some extent wrong about the 14th Amendment um, uh, and the 19th Amendment. Um, the history of the 14th Amendment is a history of um, uh, equality. And they could have used the word race in the 14th Amendment. They didn't. They used the word race in the 15th Amendment about voting rights. Um, uh, uh, but in the 14th, it's a broader principle. It's a principle of birth equality, that everyone is born equal, created equal. And that's a principle that we're born equal, not just black and white, the race issue, but we're born equal male and female. And in fact, women were strongly supportive, um, uh, uh, feminists, of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, uh, 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 and others. They didn't like Section 2 of the 14th Amendment that inserted the word male when it came to voting rights, but Section 1 they thought was aff about affirming um, equal rights of, of all. Um, and, uh, and the 19th Amendment uh, is about women's equal political participation. And, and yes, actually, in order to be politically equal, I think e um, uh, 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 Congress may believe that a prerequisite of that is that women um, be equal in the workplace and be equal when they walk out on the street and, um, and equal in their ability to be protected against, uh, against private violence against them because they're women. Congress might legitimately think so. But suppose someone thinks that the legislative history is too narrow, that that, that, that goes too far. But my claim is, why should we let that legislative history of the 14th Amendment of the 19th Amendment, if it were read, I think wrongly in my view, but if it were read to offer a kind of a narrow conception of women's rights, why should we allow that legislative history to trump? Because after all, that legislative history is a history of men, because men are the only ones voting on the 14th Amendment. And men overwhelmingly are the ones voting on the 19th Amendment. Yes, in some states, women have the vote already, so they're participating in uh, the conversation and the votes about whether to take that woman's suffrage idea and make it um, uh, the law of the land across America in a federal amendment. But, but in lots of states, the people who are voting on women's suffrage are men and only men because these states don't have women's suffrage yet. And, and so the radical thought is the very nanosecond that the 19th Amendment is adopted, it kind of calls into question to some extent the fairness of the process up to that point, even the process of its own adoption. If women, are, after the 19th Amendment are adopted, are supposed to be political equals, wasn't it unfair that they weren't equal parts in the process that, uh, of the process that, that generated the 19th Amendment, that they really weren't any part of the official voting process that generated the 14th Amendment and, and before that, the founding? Um, so. Um, let me give you an analogy. If when my kid turns 18, he's going to get to vote, and he's going to say, you know, Dad, but you know, they didn't let me vote last year and the year before, the year before that. And I say, yes, that's because you know, last year you were 17, and the year before that you were 16. You weren't actually mature enough. Now you're 18. Now you get to vote. Uh, but there's nothing that happened before was really unfair. Is that what women's suffrage was like? 
We say, oh, well, women, you know, in 1920, they're intelligent enough and capable enough to vote. But boy, in 1919, they were really um, 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 uh, immature. And in 1918, they just weren't ready for this. And, and in 1867, you know, they were, they were just children. And in the founding, they just were not able to, to think straight. No. I think the 19th Amendment, the deep logic of it, is not on the surface of the... Of, of, of the, the amendment. It, it's, it's unwritten, but I think unmistakable that the idea is that women are the political equals of men. And, and this is not something new that's happening in 1920. This, this has always been true. And then, so to some extent, the 19th Amendment, as I said, calls into question the fundamental fairness of everything that has gone before. And here's now, let's go back to our hypothetical. If Congress were to pass this law uh, affirming women's rights, the Congress that's passing it is a Congress in which women are members of that Congress, and women are voting for all the members of that Congress. And if that law is being trumped by an earlier Constitution in which women were not full participants in the 14th Amendment and the 19th Amendment, um, the process by which the 19th Amendment was adopted, and if that congressional statute that we're hypothesizing were invalidated because of the legislative history of the 14th and the 19th Amendment, an overwhelmingly male legislative history, is that really popular sovereignty when a more arguably sort of democratic um, uh, and more recent enactment in which women are full participants is being trumped by an earlier process in which women were excluded wrongfully, it seems to me, from a certain point of view, the point of view of the logic of the 19th Amendment itself. That's, that's the, the thought. So. Um, I'm proposing an unwritten rule of interpretation uh, that I think does justice to the deep logic of the 19th Amendment, where the text is fairly, of the Constitution is fairly capable of being read different ways. We um, should hesitate um, to um, invalidate congressional laws affirming women's equality based on legislative history that's overwhelmingly male. Um, of, of amendments in which women were not full participants. That, that's not really consistent with a constitution of popular sovereignty. The deep logic of why the constitution is supreme, because it actually is more democratic than an ordinary statute, is that so in our hypothetical? Or instead, is that statute actually more democratic? Because it is involving women fully in a way that the 19th Amendment itself didn't fully involve women. The 14th Amendment didn't fully involve women. The founding didn't fully involve women. Now, um, you might think, gee, um, are you saying, Professor, that all sorts of constitutional provisions mean a lot more than they say on their face? And I'm saying that's exactly what I'm saying. And it's not unique to the 19th Amendment. Let's take the freedom of speech. Uh, we've talked about it a lot in, in this uh, course. Um, when the people commit themselves in the First Amendment to the freedom of speech, I think the deep logic of that is that we, the people, are sovereign in America. We have a broad right of political expression, a right of political expression much broader than Parliament had, uh, excuse me, much broader than the English uh, uh, citizenry had, because in England, Parliament is sovereign, and so it has freedom of speech and debate from the French parler to speak, but ordinary British subjects actually aren't sovereign, and so they may not have the same broad freedom of speech. Parliament is socially superior to them and legally sovereign. But in America, no. Our government officials are not superior to us socially. They work for us. We pay them. They are our servants. They are our agents, and we are sovereign. And so the deep logic is British-style laws limiting free speech are not appropriate in America. Now, did every, that's the logic of the freedom of speech. That's the logic uh, when, when uh, extended to all Americans. That's the logic of American popular sovereignty. Did everyone at the founding understand that? No, they didn't. That's why shortly after the founding, you have people voting for a sedition act. John Adams signing into law, basically echoing British-style censorship. And they said, well, it, you know, this is, this is okay. Britain does it. They didn't appreciate. No, in America, we've committed ourselves to a newer, broader revolutionary principle. James Madison understood the principle, but did everyone else at the time? Actually, not quite. Um, the First Amendment meant more than everyone perhaps in initially understood. It had logical entailments and implications. Um, and the very a fact of popular sovereignty maybe went further than every, that some people 
initially recognized. Take the reconstruction. Originally, the, the folks who give you um, um, uh, the, an end to slavery think they can just stop there. Okay, we ended slavery. We did it immediately, universally, without, just, without compensation for the slave masters. That's a lot. That's a good day's work. We're done. But then they began to realize, no, actually, that wouldn't be stable. You can't give people freedom and not guarantee their equal citizenship, not guarantee their ultimately their equal voting rights, at least in the South, because um, how can these Southern governments be genuinely Republican governments when they're disfranchising a huge number of free men? And upon reflection, the Reconstruction Republicans thought, no, we actually we have to go further than the 13th Amendment. We've got to make sure that at least in the South, um, fr uh, freed slaves get to vote um, uh, because otherwise the southern governments won't be Republican. But they thought, okay, but, but, but that's only in the South. Maybe we don't have to do that for the North. So we're going to impose black suffrage on the South as a condition of the South coming back into the Union and getting reseated in Congress, but we won't impose that on the North. And then people began to think, no, actually, the deep logic of, of equality, of the battle sacrifices of of free blacks of, of, of the deepest and broadest idea of, of Republican government is the northern states have to let blacks vote equally too, not just the southern states. And this gets codified in the 15th Amendment. And so actually, although um, the 13th Amendment began more modestly, people under, began to understand shortly thereafter that it had implications and entailments that that upon reflection really had to go further than merely an end of slavery. And so we end up with an affirmation of citizenship in the 14th Amendment and the imposition of um, certain um, uh, rules about black suffrage on the former Confederacy and eventually the extension of those rules of, of equal racial suffrage to the North as well. Uh, so um, what was true of the First Amendment. What was true of the Reconstruction, it seems to me, is also true of the 19th Amendment. It has broader and deeper implications um, than merely a right to vote. And in the le next lecture, I'll trace a few more of the implications. Today I've talked about its implications for congressional power to pass uh, laws protecting women in all sorts of ways. In the next lecture, um, I'll tell you about how we need to rethink marriage laws um, to some extent in light of the 19th Amendment. Uh, the role of the First Lady and of Vice Presidents in light of the 19th Amendment. Um, we'll talk about actually Griswold and Roe, two very famous cases about women's rights in the 20th century. Um, and again, in light of wom uh, the women's suffrage idea, the women's equality idea. So a lot still to talk about. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to end, as always, by telling you a little bit about the, uh, the picture for this chapter. This is a picture about women on juries or not on juries. And it turns out the 19th Amendment has something to say about that as well. So stay tuned.